Oh, okay, all right, here we go. Host, okay. All right, hello everybody, welcome back. How's everybody doing? Great. All right, great, great, great. We have Orlando, I believe, Orlando from Duozona joining us. No, uh, and, and Wei Zhao. And, and Wei, that's right, yeah, yeah, both of you, welcome. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, writing for flute, some flute techniques and take it over if you, if you want. Great, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming in. Thank you. Um, so what um, we're going to talk today, it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about flute writing that uh, you might have heard in the past or maybe not. Right. And then we're just going to give some examples of things that will work well with the high flutes, the low flutes, and, you know, maybe a little small primer into extended techniques if we have time, okay? But um, we're going to start from the very, very basic. So it might be a little bit boring from the beginning, but I, I want you to, you know, just to bear with us. And, you know, I promise then we can make it a little bit much more interesting and complicated. And of course, at any time, if you have any questions whatsoever, you know, you can stop us anytime. Don't miss the opportunity to, to have a question. If you want to write it in the chat, that's that's okay. I probably okay. I'm gonna open the chat to see if I can monitor it at the same time. So, but the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is just um, let me see if I can share it. Oh, this is interesting. This is the first time um, I'm using this. Uh, um, Hold on, you have to give me a second. It so happens that um, yesterday, uh, my old computer crashed. So um, I'm gonna have to quit and reopen to be able to share things, okay? So I will be back in like one second, okay? Yeah, that happened to my computer just like five minutes ago. So. All right. Hi, and we're back. Sorry, this is what happened yesterday. My old computer died and I bought this computer just yesterday evening. So I am just um, starting to, to, you know, restart everything like Zoom. And for some reason, I couldn't share things. I have to get permission from all the um, apps. So um, Alex, if you want to allow us to be co-host again, that would be great. And I don't I think I have the permission yet. I am the co-host that couldn't make me make you a co-host. Well, oh, I I don't have the permission to do that, unfortunately. Okay, so I think it's Elizabeth the host who has. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, so okay, so Elizabeth, if you're hearing us, if you're there, you know, wherever you are in the cloud. You know, if you can allow us. But in the meantime, I'm just going to start. OK, so pretty much um, as you all know, the flute, it's a, it's a very simple system of um, of working, you know, the vibration of air into doing something um, that that makes sound. OK, so as everybody knows, you know, once you blow in through the flute, uh, depending on what fingering you, you have, you get a different length of of air vibration, you get a different frequency, and then you get a different note and so forth. That's very, very simple. Now, here is um, a little bit of a different take on it. Okay, so my flute, um, come, uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. my flute and waist flutes are a little bit different. Okay, so um, they all look the same, but if you look at the feet, which are the, the bottom parts there, Way has a C foot and I have a B foot. That means yeah. that we only have one note different. I, I can play 
b3 she can play all the way down to c4 okay so when we are playing any chromatic scale or any scale and we are lifting all of our fingers we're gonna get c sharp right we get c sharp as well good so now we are in c sharp i believe that would be c sharp five right okay so now if i start over again with the next d that actually happens to be an overtone okay so even though when it sounds very nice it's just because the technology has made it so that the um, the size of the keys as you can see they are different the distance is a little bit different um etc so that makes it so that all of these flutes right now make that second um that, that second octave sound very natural and very fundamental but it's not fundamental at all so and that is something that i want you to keep in mind because we're going to have to you know remember that as we go along today okay so once again if i go from um as soon as i get to d The only reason I'm getting that higher octave is because I'm overblowing, but it's exactly the same finger is. And that's my other C sharp, now that is uh, C sharp six. So I'm gonna keep overblowing, but I'm gonna overblow with the, the lowest possible fingerings, the original fingerings. And I want you to notice now, the third octave is gonna sound much wispier, very out of tune, much clankier. Right? I cannot even get to that B. So as you can see, what we are really working with is almost like a, a one string instrument that goes from B, or in the case of waste flute from low C to C sharp. And then everything else after that, it's an, a harmonic. It's a partial actually, okay? And that is something to keep in mind very, very, very close. So. Um, pretty much if you can, if you could write, I mean, I, once I get called a co-host, I'll be able to, to share a, a chart with you. But, um, I think at this point I still, I, can... I, I just messaged Elizabeth like five times. So hopefully okay. she can see you soon. <laughs> she might be the apologies, okay. apologies. No, no, no. As soon as I can get to that, I will, I'll share. So, um, but that's the most important thing to remember that, um, many of our, um, many of the notes that we play are actually overblown and they are all already partials they're already harmonics okay um, that means that because of that everything that sounds very high in the flute or in the high flutes is going to have you know a lot a smaller spectrum than when it is in the you know in the fundamental and for that reason it takes a lot to do with um, intonation, it has a lot to do with voicing, and it has a lot to do with um, all sorts of, of writing, okay? So um, those, all the flutes that we have, so for example, this is the concert flute, right? Uh, they all work the same way. Let's show the piccolo, mm -hmm. please. And what we have is, you know, the piccolo you probably have seen before, it's very common, and again, it's just, twice, uh, this is twice as long as this, twice as short as this, right? It sounds exactly an octave higher, but again, it works the same exact way. The mechanism is exactly the same way. The fingerings work exactly the same way. Good. So my lowest note is that B. It's true. And the lowest note of the piccolo is just written D4, okay? So sounding D5, that's the only, okay? Good. And then, uh, Take your regular flute. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the bass flute that you, again, you might have seen before. And waist flute, as you can see, it's only about, you know, half of the size of this bass flute. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the bore is also twice as big, as you can see. It's a mm -hmm. very big, very big tube. Okay. And what that does, it affords a, a much like airier and hollow and smoky sound. The, right right 
So, um, but again, they all function exactly the same way. The very first octave is just a fundamental octave. And finally, the very common and very usual um, alto flute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I, you know, so it's a, let's compare size. Mm -hmm. And again, as you can see, it's a little bit in between bass and regular flute. And the board, again, is just a little bit bigger. Um, and again, just because it's, it's, it's a bigger round hole, then makes it for a lot of smoky sound. Right? So, and again, it's a transposing instrument in G. So my lowest note is uh, G3. Okay, so um, when you write for flute, if you keep this idea of making things very much like a string instrument, right? You know that the higher you go in a pitch, the narrower the, uh, what does it call? The almost like the the frequency gets, the quicker those, uh, the frequency gets, okay? That's why when you're playing the piccolo very, very high, you know, it's almost like you're getting a drill in your ear, whereas when it's the low flutes, you know, it's very nice and comfortable and it sounds very, you know, almost very, I don't know, fluffy in a way, right? So um, when you're when you're thinking about writing flute for flute, the it takes a lot more time for the whole entire flute to vibrate in the lower frequencies than in the top frequencies, making things such as articulation, just to start with, very difficult, okay? Comparatively to the top. So for example, you know, there's different places, different pieces, uh, like the Enesco, there's a piece by Enesco called Cantabile e Presto. And the Presto starts with a low D. And because it's so low, it sounds very strong and very, um, very clunky in a way, right? It is just because the flute takes a long time to, to play, right? However, in the second exact um, rendition of the phrase, it's an octave higher and it sounds much cleaner. And I, I hope that you can hear the difference, but um, with this in mind, the lower you go with any flute, the, the, the harder it will be to play with very clear articulation and the higher that you go, the articulation is gonna be much, much cleaner. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to add? Anything about that? It's just a low register, very weak for the flute. In terms of attack and articulation, it is going to be yeah. very weak. Okay. So, um, do you mind playing that with with piccolo, just to show? So, which one? Cantabile. Yeah. Just, I mean, just the taka 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 the beginning. So as we go higher in the octave, it's going to get very, very nice and clean and clean and that sharpness in tone that that is very characteristic of um, orchestral writing. OK, mm -hmm. so and the same thing happens with with bass flute. If I was to play, you know, that piece with bass flute below. <laughs> You know, it almost cannot speak at that speed. It's just the nature of the instrument. It takes so much more for the air to travel around. So, yeah, it takes, you know, it takes extra time. So I wouldn't be able to do it at the same speed that uh, way could do it in the piccolo, okay? So keeping that in mind um, for articulation, it's very, um, it's very important that you consider that low, is slow, right? And high can be very quick and very, very fast. All right. Um, yeah. Any any questions about that so far? That one is pretty straightforward. In a way, the way I can, you know, help you remember is if you're writing a, a double bass solo, right? It's gonna be very uh, uncharacteristic. If if you write sixteenth notes for a bass, it's gonna be less distinct that if you write it for a violin right mm -hmm. and in a violin if you write something for g string it's going to be very robust as opposed to if you write something in the e string which is going to be a little bit higher and it's going to be more clean and, and characteristic right yeah right so 
Now, uh, on keeping on with this, um, if you um, if you have heard any uh, orchestral music ever ever, it's very typical for the composers to put the piccolo on top of the orchestra, kind of like in the in the very 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 last line as mm -hmm. kind of like um overtone catcher and that is something that is really good when you are reading for um when you are writing for all of these flutes yeah, 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 yeah. i can share the screen now yeah <laughs> thank you okay. so this is pretty much the range of the flute as is taught right and um as i was telling you before this is the way that you should be thinking about that range in which that very first that very first octave is the only fundamental octave everything else is going to be an overtone okay so for example everything that i played for you earlier was using the fingerings below and as you can see i i played pretty much from uh, all of these oct and this all of these partials right that means that there's the other fifth partial here like the or the second partial third partial with the a where it starts the, the fifth above so as you can see i didn't choose to play that but it, it's also there if i wanted to do it but because the flute is now so well done with external fingerings then you can make sound a flute very clean and very beautiful in this area here which can me make it sound like it's playing a regular you know a regular instrument as if it wasn't overblown okay and that is the that is the trick between those um uh, between thinking about the flute as a one string instrument that's why i call it the monochordal philosophy of thinking about the flute okay so um because we're talking about overtones then when you're writing for flute it's very um it's it's very easy to tune in the low for unison and it's very hard to tune in the high for unison because the margin of error gets smaller and smaller as we go ahead, right? Mm -hmm. So if we play, I don't know, the low, low C, is that okay? That's very easy for us to find, right? Let's play the uh, one above them. So at this point, I'm already being very, very careful so that I can kind of like play much softer that way. And I can kind of like slide my sound into her sound. Otherwise, it's going to be very jarring. How about G? And at that point, I already have to start adjusting a little bit. If I started right away, you probably heard some wah, 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 right? You can make an out of tone. Yes, B. Yeah, are you trying to tune? Hey, no, I'm trying to out of tune. Oh, you're trying to out of tune, yeah. So it takes very little to play out of tune. Let's try to tune it, okay? okay? The high B. And there we are. So it took so much longer to tune that high B because again, the margin of error is so tiny that we're constantly adjusting. In the low register, it's not a problem with intonation. Now, having said that, there are a lot of uh, pieces out there, contemporary music that is either microtonal or has a lot of glissandi and has a lot of, um, you know, minor seconds that love to do that. So if we are actually doing the opposite and if you want to write something that is very powerful and very jarring and if you want to do something that is uh, very shocking and clanking to each other definitely the higher register is going to be worse so why don't you play the b and i play b flat right so then that is very but yes let's play the the low one you play lowest b I don't have you. Okay. And well, you can tell that it's actually a, a minor second as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's not nearly as jarring. It just sounds, um, you know, a little more comfortable per mm -hmm. se. Okay. But again, it's much easier to tune 
below, then it's much easier to tune above. Okay, and because pretty much the flute it's uh, made up of all sorts of you know um, you know overblown things, it's very easy to tune if you happen to know your um, your overtone series. Okay. I so remember last time we play a piece is uh, like uh, you play one person play high is a C and one person play high is a C sharp or D. Yes, correct. Last summer we had a piece where it was a lot of minor seconds and the in the very highest register. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. All right. So um just gonna share this for you guys a little bit. This is pretty much the uh the flute overtone series and um we're gonna I mean it, it all looks pretty much what you expect, right? Now I wanna bring to you the this information here that this, as you see here, has two nodes at the same time, sometimes three nodes. And I want you to notice also the dynamics here. Okay. And I'm gonna leave that on for a little bit while I explain this. Okay. And I'm gonna start with the low B. Okay. So when you play the low B, and I'm just gonna keep fingering that low B that you have there. But I'm gonna keep on going up the the um the harmonic series. So that's the F sharp. And now I'm gonna get to a point in which the size of the flute is so large that I am not being to be able to find an actual specific note between the F sharp and the A or the A or the B or any of the notes that follow there. And I'm gonna to have to actually play louder to get them. So right now, because of the physics of the instrument, I cannot separate those overtones. They're so close to each other. That's the F sharp. That's the A, but you can still hear a little bit of F, F sharp, right? And when I'm playing that B, I already have to play very forte, and I still hear the A. For the next one, the C sharp. So uh, already there, there's a cluster that is very hard to differentiate. Okay, and as you can see, I am blowing very, very hard just in order for for us to get it. Okay, could you try way? Let's try from the C. Let's try the same thing. There's anything? Yeah. So you can hear B, C, D, right? B flat, C, D kind of thing. So, um, but again, that goes to say how close it gets here if you are fingering down here. Of course, um, if you keep going up in the fundamentals, you're gonna get a lot less, um, you know, partials because it's like the string is getting shorter and shorter. So it's gonna be very, very hard to to hear the partials now. Uh, you probably have already realized that then in the flute, we have B, C, and C sharp. We actually have two fundamentals. So we also have this, you know, B, C, and C sharp as fundamentals as well. But as you can see, it's very hard to get to those because at that point, we are using pretty much almost half of the tube only. So if I wanted to do exactly the same partials with the B starting in uh, B4, right? I cannot get any higher than that. Doesn't matter how loud I can play. It's just it's not gonna speak. It is it is B, I think. It's just it, it's just almost a little bit like B, yeah. So um the other thing that this is very cool to know is that as you are um writing for flute, you can think about that wonderful style of writing that is um typical of um Hindemith. and now i am not entirely uh, you know i am by no means an expert in uh Hindemith's, um you know the theory of writing but if you're familiar with it Hindemith does says 
sets are kind of like a hierarchy of of intervals in from less dissonant to most dissonant. Is any anybody familiar with this? Uh, more or less, yeah. Um, again, I don't think it's something that is really really taught nowadays, except very in passing. But um, I just want to share a little bit of what um, what he has here. So um, he has the the pitches here, as you can see. But also he has you know um, a set of intervals here, right? Which is the series that go from, in his opinion, from less dissonant or more consonant to the triton, which is supposed to be the most dissonant, okay? And the reason why I wanted to bring this to your attention is because the very first five are all pretty much in like in this the harmonic series, right? It's octave, fifth, fourth, third, right? Um, you know, and I don't think we get to a, another thing of a six, we get, we get to a seventh before we get to the six. So, but if you can remember the the very first, um, um, you know, five of the harmonic series, which I'm sure you can, right? You can see that that is really, really easy to tune for the flute. So if you play the low D and I'm gonna play an A. That it sounds very nice and, and confident. Same thing if you play, uh, I don't know, low D and I'll play the high D. Right? It's very actually easy to tune. Now, cool thing about this is that when you are writing for a lower flute than the concert flute, so for example, if I play down my low D and Wei plays her low D, she's actually going to make the bass flute sound louder because she's pretty much bringing out the overtone out of this flute. So suddenly the, the bass flute by itself is going to sound softer, believe it or not, than when Wei plays it because she's actually grabbing onto that overtone and carrying the bass flute with her. <laughs> Let me start and then you start. So it's a really cool thing when you have um, the bass flute and you have one of those partials, it's almost like the flute will help it bring out. And I also feel my uh, sounds double than, than play by myself. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and again, it's just because we're playing with the natural harmonic series. So uh, in the future, let's say if for the speed writing, you're writing something that has bass flute and it has um, something like, um, um, what can I say, um, a duo that is unison or in fifths or in fourths, that is going to actually bring out the low flute, even though when it sounds a little bit softer by itself. Why don't we do something a little bit um, strange? I'm going to play like D, E, F, sharp, G, A, G, F. Yep, ready? But it's not like da, da. And I'm gonna play just the, starting from G, right below. So, I mean, it, it makes it like a, a really cool homophonic sound because we're playing with those, right? Good. Uh, I'm going to play the same thing, but I'm going to play tritones. Okay? okay. So you play exactly the same thing? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't know how it sounds there to you. Obviously, it still sounds a little bit cool, kind of like a chorus, but suddenly the bass flute, it sounds like somebody like poked it and it went like. <laughs> And it sounded like suddenly much, much thinner than before. Okay, so let's try them, play the second the same thing, and I'm gonna play once again from G. Okay. So we're done again because we are in consonant, we can bring out the sound of the low flute much easier. Okay. Feel we're double. Yes. So um, one of the 
And that's one of the first examples um, that I wanted to share with you today uh, from one of the pieces that we have played um, a while back. Um, we play this beautiful piece. It's actually for two regular flutes, uh, Reflections on Three Icelandic Folk Songs. Okay, And one of the things I really like about this piece is the use of uh, fourths and fifths, um, you know, in order to create a sensation of that very, you know, um, um, I don't want to say, uh, where is that, um, you know, like open sound that is very characteristic of that Nordic um, style of writing that comes all the way from pretty much Sibelius. Okay. Um, you want to play one? So we're going to play a little bit of the beginning and I just want you to listen first of all that we, uh, for the unisons and then you know the fourth unison the fourth and then when it moves into bar nine it moves into the third so notice how different the feel of it is once we are getting away from that um, usual partial <laughs> So the difference between that unison and the and the third it's is actually very very striking. Okay. Um, another great use of the 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 fifths here that we have it's in this piece that we're actually going to be playing um, in the recital coming up. Okay. And I want you to look at that top line here. I hope everybody can see it, right? And I want you to notice, you know that most, most of the time they are forced in those very beginning um, notes there, and it makes it for a very open and very powerful sound, okay? So, ready? So as you can hear, like the very first the very first part of that part of that bar before it gets to the B flat C, it actually sounds very nice and open, almost as you know, a little bit like like Copland in a way. You wanna get to it? Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, maybe a little slow, like each uh, chord. Sure, of course. You wanna start from the F? Uh, where? Okay. into something a little bit different okay but again it's the use that Mushinsky uses for all of this you know open and very non distinct um you know dialects so let's play a little bit of this line mm -hmm. because you can see that there's going to be octaves and then four so they're going to pop in and out almost um in a way that that sounds almost like thin thick thin thick and so forth okay and then we're gonna play out to the end of the line where I, um, you know, when the the drone is in the bottom as opposed to the top. I think you are. In I F. think it's A flat. It's A flat. Yeah. Sorry, we we cannot see the score. We can only see the. <laughs> Suddenly, as you can see there, it goes into a lot more um, of a less open sound. So, um, again, going back to say, if you can play with the range of the overtone series, then you can actually produce very easy from very, very, very consonant and easy to tune to dissonant and not easy to tune. Okay, it's a really cool psychological effect. Again, same thing. If you're tuning 
two low string instruments, like two cellos in open strings, right? It's gonna sound a little bit different than if you're playing like a hurdy-gurdy or something that is very short and very nasal, right? It just opens it up that way, okay? And as we said before, the higher you go, the, the, the partials get closer and closer, so it's harder and harder to tune, okay? So when we are actually playing in orchestra, it's very important that the flute players on top are tuning very, very, very carefully. And if you listen to any of the great orchestral pieces from the Romantic period, you're going to notice that there's a big uh, involvement in open bass, right? But the top, the notes in the winds are the softest ones and are in the, in the top. So you have the basses and the cellos and then, you know, maybe the second violin is doubling octave with them. And then the top is kind of like the, the first flute on F sharp and the second flute in D, you know, in a D major chord, something like that. And it just brings that teeny little fat brightness on top of this, this chord, okay? And it's something that I believe Schopenhauer talks about, like tuning in, in, a, in a pyramid where the bass should be larger than, than the top. So, so as you are writing, just, just keep in mind that, you know, the higher octave, you know, usually if it's softer, it's gonna sound much more balanced than if it's louder than than the bass. Okay. Um, any any questions so far about this? No. Good. All right. So again, if you ever have any question, you can you can tell us. All right. So um, what we have talked so much so far, and I forgot where I put my notes now. Or well, you know, I had a plan. <laughs> if you find the machine I can find the notes. Okay. Let me see if I can extrapolate from the other the other pieces that we have here. No, it's okay. I, I don't think it's okay. So good. All right. The um the other very, very important thing that I wanted to talk to you about, it's a little bit of implied harmonies and in which uh, when you only have two, um, two flutes, two, two people playing, uh, you can see, yeah, this is the one, you can see, thank you so much. You can see that there is a setting of the mind in what, is the actual um, tune, the actual um, tuning that you want, the actual chord that you're trying to, to get, all right? So there are many ways to explain this. And usually when it's flute solo, it's actually very easy to do, okay? In general, um, if it's the first beat of a bar, it has a big, huge bearing on the setting up of that chord or whatnot, or at least the essence of that chord, okay? So there is nothing uh, better that I can think of right now for flute solo than the partita in A major. Right, so he's trying to say A minor, right? At the beginning, and it is starts with an actual 16th notes rest. So it starts with one E and a two E and a three E and a two E and a one. So it's in four four. And he always sets the A or whatever is the root of that chord in the very strong beats, you know, either one or three, and then eventually it's two and usually it uses four to lead to set up the, the dominant function as it may, you know, very widely tone, right? So it's gonna be one. So he's using two things. He's using the bass and then he is using the placement of the beat, okay? So those are very important considerations when setting up um, the tune, um, the tuning or the key of a piece, okay? So I'm gonna go back to Mishinsky, okay? And I'm gonna go back to, to this piece that we're gonna hear. So in this piece, it's in, um, I don't know, I, you guys might know better than me, but it's definitely in A flattish, okay? 
but you really don't hear it until the very end okay so i want you to listen if you don't mind playing this way just all to the way to a flat all right so that is pretty much um how it is um yes mishinsky mishinsky is was very very good very very much good so i want you to notice how you have that idea of a flat and you're gonna hear that when i'm here with that conflicting is this um a flat dorian or a flat you know aeolian with the ionian sorry with that uh c there right or the e flat you know this is major minor perhaps he's he's creating that conflict right and then we finally maybe kind of like consider you know this downbeat there in the last bar of that first line as finally our setting up especially because there's a repetition of the notes in the beginning okay so play that one more time and then i'm going to play the accompaniment for you okay so i'm going to add the accompaniment and you're going to notice two things that they, this is going to throw you off a little bit and we get to the F, it's almost like throwing a little bit of an six chord there. It's a it's a very cool flavor to it. Also here with the F, and then it kind of like gets resolved there when we finally get both to the A flat. Okay, so let's try that. So as you can see, you know, he's actually taking the time to fool us by adding that F long in the very most powerful beat of that part, which is the first beat. Okay. And also here, pa -di -da. and even though when then immediately follows by A flat and E flat and C flat, which will be like a perfect quarter because of the F, it throws it off a little bit. Okay. So let's try it one more time, and then we're going to go to the end of the piece to show you the other part of it. So again, very subtle use of, you know, the, the placement of the beat to create that sensation of keys, okay? And you can see this in history all, all about, okay? Now, we're going to go to the very end of the piece in which you hear really something really cool, how, you know, he switches from this G and E flat major, right? By just changing the G to the A flat at the end, because we have heard so much of this A flat center. In fact, you have heard a lot of it here when we played that before it's kind of like already ingrained there mm -hmm. and because the g natural is such a strong leading tone so long with that e flat which is the dominant function of a flat we end up having that dorian feeling towards the end actually let's play from the last three bars first and then we're gonna go from the from that second to last line So just by changing that A flat to E flat, even though when it doesn't have a third that says major or minor, you still hear that from before. Let's do that from the second to last line. And I want you to notice how suddenly it does still sound like A flat minor ish, okay?
And the only reason I wanted to throw that C natural there is because I wanted to suddenly change in the mind of you guys, the listeners, from minor to major, right? So as you can see, that C flat was implied a long time ago, and it's sustained just by how the placement of the notes make it sound minor, 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 minor. So then suddenly you have a you know a perfect interval, A flat to E flat but it still sounds minor because of what happened before. Okay, so I guess in short, again, then this is a great idea to try to use in your speed writing if you're doing it, is just try to play around with it, try to play with the listener's memory. It's uh, much easier to do when you're using two voices because you can set up kind of like a chord in a way, but at the same time, you can imply major, minor, and then just by doing open, intervals you can still carry that sensation of minor or major okay does that does that make any any sense here yeah so it's a interesting use of um uh what is it called of of psychology right um yes this this also reminds me of an exercise that i tend to do a lot which is by not the president of Haiti that was just killed. This is somebody called Marcel Moise, but it's the same last name, Moise, right? So Marcel Moise actually was a very, very famous flute player. And um, he wrote this book in which he probably wrote all the possible permutations of fingers. Um, yes, that guy. This guy. And the book that I, I tend to play is this one okay and this one has all the permutations and this is something that it's a uh, very interesting to me one of the things that he asks us to do towards the end of the book is chords that are sevens a few a few seven chords okay so i don't know if you can see it all right well here's the thing um I'm going to I'm going to play a little bit of the uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to play the F um, the F7 chord, right? But I'm going to play the F minor minor. So it's going to be the F minor and the minor seventh, okay? So what I always found out by playing this, which also was very interesting psychologically is that to me, once I get to this particular seven chord, it actually sounds more like a major chord with the six on it by, by shifting it. So for example, the very first permutation I have to play is, and because the F is in the root in the bottom most note, sounds very F minor plus the seventh, right? However, when I play it starting in the third, it does sound more A flat major with a six. And again, this is something really interesting because that sounds more like an A flat six than an actual inversion chord. And the reason why it happens is just by one thing, you just change the, the root of the, of the chord. If I go from the fifth, now i hear only a flat because my shibine just flipped it so suddenly i'm no longer playing f7 chord i'm playing a flat six chords does that make sense so it's all about how the memory carries the weight of that um of that root and also the placement so for example we're gonna go It just it's just the, all the same notes. I just change it from minor to major with that extra note there. So and then I see Cisa asking a question. Yes. So yeah, let me tell you a little bit as a break. You guys have been real troopers. So my bass flute, it's an uncommon bass flute. This is a Robert Dick bass flute, which has a B foot. And Robert Dick designed that because of the uh, extended techniques and the multiphonics that he had to play with a B foot, right? So 
My bass flute is one of the rare ones that does have it. It also has trill keys. Bass flutes don't usually have trill keys, okay? So for bass flute, when you're writing, no trills with the C and D, and also C foot in the, in the future. But if you wanted to write something with B foot or trills uh, for us this summer, you can totally do it, okay? Um, also, uh, alto flutes do not come with a, a B foot. Or an F sharp foot, right? So they're always, right? They're always like that, and they do have um, trill keys. Cool. So um, good. Um, I'm not gonna go much much longer, but I'm gonna go back to the chart I had um, earlier, and I want to tell you a little bit. Since we're talking about trills, I want to tell you a little bit about tremolos. Okay, so I'm going to go back here and I want you to always remember the C sharps. Okay, C sharp and D. We're going to call it the breaks. And those are the breaks of when the flute player needs to go up to the higher octave. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to ask Wei to demonstrate. Okay, when, um, oops, I lost you guys. Um, Oh no, <laughs> I closed the, the screen. Chula. Oh, my, <laughs> no. Sorry, let me stop sharing because I, I lost you. I couldn't see you. All right. So um, I wanted to demonstrate something. I wanted to demonstrate if you go sideways, like stand up here, okay. how do you change octave? So come a little bit closer and do not really that. Oh, but, you, but, but you're closer to but the... many different ways. I can uh, for the octave change. I can change my lips, or I keep my lip uh, uh, stable, but uh, I change my air. Mm -hmm. Can you can you demonstrate both? Okay, so maybe first uh, is uh, change the lips. <laughs> do that. Do that sideways so they can see your jaw moving. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> And if I play piano to 40, they can see more of my draw. Good, yeah. So the, the reason why I want to show you this is because in order to overblow, to get to that second octave that we talked about, we need to do that jaw movement, OK? We need to do that, OK? So what happens is that when you are writing any sort of tremolo that is not just a major second, right? So, for example, if you're writing it's low C to F, that is not a problem. If I'm writing which is low F to C, right? It is not a problem. But from writing from this C, which is below the break to the F that is above the F, and that F is above the break, it's not gonna sound. You're either gonna get the low F or. And the reason is because now I am in between those two breaks, okay? So anytime you're writing a tremolo for flute, it's very important to consider those seizures. So between D and C, it's gonna be very easy, between low B, no problem, but between B and high D, I have to start moving my things. Right. That's what the trill keys are there for, for some of these trills, which open a little key in the back. But for example, below the break, you want to either get the higher one or the lower one or sometimes a little bit of that in between, okay? So um, I will send you all of this, but if it's very simple, if you remember just the, uh, oops, I lost it because I closed it before when I panicked. So um, when, when uh, you are writing any sort of tremolo, just make sure you stay within those, um, those, um, 
breaks. Okay, so between C and D sharp, not a problem. Okay, now um, this one between D and the higher octave is going to be a little bit more different because the top one starts to change. The higher you go, you need to keep readjusting your embouchure. So any, anything that between D and G, it starts to get very fuzzy because of the angle of the of the fruit. However, below that, between this D and the bottom one, it's very safe to assume that any tremolo between these two notes and any tremolo between the other D and the C sharp, those are going to be safe to to write any any tremolo. Okay, and that is also something that you can remember. Just remember C sharp. Um, and that's all. That's all. Good. Uh, sure, Jason. Did did the were you able to see the image? I'm actually going to share this with Elizabeth. I'm going to send it so that she can share it with everybody. Okay. So if you haven't been able to take notes now, I'll send it to you later. Okay. Um, good. All right. Yeah. So here is here we go. Um, bass flute range is going to be the same as the regular flute. In fact, um, this, this is going to be true for all the flutes. Let me get to the range one more time and share that with you. OK, so um, anything that you see here, you know, obviously the alto flute is going to be transposing, right? But the low, the bass flute, if I play the low B there, and this is the C, which is going to be more common. I probably can get to the C, you know, below that F sharp over that. What it will be there then? And that's the D. That is two layer lines plus an octave higher. I don't know which number is actually that. What is that? Four? Four, five, six, seven. So, but it sounds an octave lower. And you do write on the uh, bass, uh, sorry, on the treble clef. Even for bass flute, you always write in treble clef. Alto flute is the same thing. You always write in treble clef. Okay? Wow, you're so low. I'm a... this note. Yeah, so then the higher flute can go very, very high. Now, the piccolo starts at D, so but so it all it all transposes. So when I say D, it will be like the D that is hanging right below the stuff. Okay, that is the lowest, um, not in the piccolo. Although there is a company here in Boston called Nagahara that has started to make um, what they call the mini, and because it's like a mini flute, it's kind of like a piccolo with a seafood, but it's very rare still. So it's not common yet. So. That's so weird. Yeah. When it's very weird, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually really, really cool. So, yeah. yeah. Wait, hold on. I have two more messages there. Um, yes. <laughs> Bass flute is reverse piccolo in a way. Yes, absolutely. In many ways, actually. Yes. Um, good. So, yes, flutter tongue. We're going to talk a little bit about flutter tongue. Flutter tongue is not genetic. I actually, I'll tell you my story. So, flutter tongue is something that Every flute player can do. It. Everybody can do it. Okay, you can do flutter tongue. Uh, yeah, the little one. Okay. Good. And when when you mean the little one is because you mean the one in the throat. Like... Yeah, the top one. Yes, the one where you actually flirt in like I like the French, yeah. right? The kitty one, right? So the other one is what I call the Italian one, the, the right? With it in the front, right? So when I was growing up, I couldn't do the back one. I actually started to slowly go until I finally was able to do it, okay? So yes, you can do it. And if you know um, that famous composer, Brian Ferniho, right? who is in California. He actually has that very famous piece, Cassandra's Dream Song, in which he actually asked for both kinds of flutter tone. So this one is the one which I call the lingual one with the tongue, and the guttural one. 
So the guttural one is much more softer and much more um, much more kinder in a way. The other one is much more aggressive. So when I am playing in the low register, I usually use the guttural one because it doesn't interrupt the, the embouchure. If I go with the lower one, because my tongue is fluttering right behind the lips, it makes all sorts of mess in the way that the air is going into there. So that's the Italian one, the lingua. And that's the French one, the guttural one, which is much easier to do, okay? You can do flutter tongue anywhere in all registers, in all flutes, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a that's a very good question. So yeah, can you do the other one? The, the small one? The no, I don't, I don't know that. I just working for me the little one. Yeah. yeah. So again, some people can do both. Some people can do one or the other. Yeah. So just keep that in mind as you do as you do Florida, right? Um, and the other the other thing that it's um, it's interesting it's the the use of um, of non air techniques can be enclosing anything that you don't overblow. Okay, so if you remember, we were just talking about um, the the fundamental, which goes from that low C to that high C sharp, right? C4 to C sharp five, right? That's the flute fundamental. If you stay within that and only within that, you can do all sorts of percussive techniques. If you go above that, it's just gonna drop down because there's no way that we can overblow something that doesn't use air. So for example, you know, if I am, and I took the bass flute because it sounds, so if I am just hearing the keys, right? Right? So if you are using that, I cannot go above that C sharp and even the C sharp, you know, I don't have fingers to hit, right? I don't really have fingers, to hit, but if you go below from G, A, perhaps down to the lowest part, you can get very clearly defined. So when you flutter with your mouth totally in, you get that kind of like that lion roar that you can get in the in the flutes. Okay. So, and when I mean any any absolutely any percussive technique. You know, below C sharp five is going to be so so easy to do. So I'm gonna pick up my regular flute. If you wanna do any sort of attack, for example, any syllable attack is very simple. You just go or right. There's no sound and there's not enough air to overblow. But you can go. You wanna try something like? Yeah, it gets seen. Doesn't work. Maybe with yeah. Actually, with the and this, you can still hear it a little bit. Yeah. So, but again, we cannot go up to the upper octave. It doesn't matter how hard we try, we will. The the effect is going to sound below that. So there is no reason why to write like. Key click in the C two, two octaves higher, like C six. Key click is gonna sound below. It's really or an attack that high is just gonna sound the octave below, just because the physics. There's not enough air to overblow. Yeah. Is there a okay? Let me see. Yes. So um, again, among the many disasters that you know happened today, it's like I was not able to. Um, download my Sibelius in time to upload it and redo it and whatnot. I was going to write all this. Um, for uh, Flutter Tongue, it's very easy. You, you just write any note and you write below and you write one to three lines, right? As in like 30 second notes or 64 second notes. And it's always advisable to always write FL. T or FLZ, sometimes fluted song is with the Z because of the German ones 
right? Just always mark it there, you know, with the three, you know, um, lines across, like you're going to do a, um, like a violin tremolo, that same kind of notation, right? Um, for notation for percussive attacks, I have seen a bunch. I, I actually have seen many. And one of them that I can, I can say works very well, it's always the, the X note head for key click. So instead of having, let's say, a quarter note note head, just put an X note head in the A and you just write key clicks or put it in your um, explanation page, you know? And that's what it is. Um, Vares, which is the first one who used it, used uh, a little note and then a plus on top and a plus sign that says, this is a key click pretty much below, okay? So uh, you can come up with your notation, you know, whatever it is. I'm just telling you the more common ones. For percussive attack, what we call the lip pits, which is the like explosive P, right? What we have seen is usually the accent note head in which it looks like this or the other way around. And, you know, you can, you can find that easily in finale C values. You use that there. But again, as usually, I always recommend to be redundant. Lip pits, it will be like this and just write it on top, lip pits, something like that. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, also, if you want attacks, you know, especially um, there has been, you know, people who have write, written this note head and below they might write P for the, or TSC for CH, like for ch, or S for S. So you can actually put the uh, uh, consonant below, right? Don't use vowels because we're not going to be able to say, ah, oh, who is the, it all depends on the shape of the jaw. We were probably just going to be like, because our mouth is going to be in this position always, okay? So you don't need to write an actual vowel there. Uh, in fact, if you have ever, ever need to try some uh, percussive effect, don't say it, but just do it with your mouth. So let's say P, and you can do that right now. Put your hand right there and just go. And you're going to notice that there's a huge explosion of air coming out. But if you do it with H, you're going to be with much less, right? With a T, you're going to notice that it's also a little different one, which brings me to um, Kira's um, answer, which is P which is what we call lips because they, we're using their lips with the tongue, right? It's just a farther back. So it's less concentrated. It's almost like the air spreads out like that as opposed to just being the explosion really, really close to the, to the um, edge of the flute, okay? I hope that answers your question here, okay? Yeah. Um, we're probably gonna wrap it up pretty soon. Um, okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> A lot of good questions and good demonstrations. Appreciate everybody. And thank you again, Do us on that. And yeah, and looking forward for a concert. I think that will be 29th. That's correct. It's the yeah, 29th. Yeah. We'll be there. So listen, uh, I'm going to send all of this um, information to uh, Elizabeth so that she can share it with everybody. Please uh, and thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem. And what I will also ask you guys to do is that if you have any questions ever, you know, you guys can just email us, you know, anything. If you're writing for the speed writing um, event, right? If you have any questions, just send us a sample. You can send us like three measures and we'll play it for you and we'll tell you that is that is not a problem. We're happy to help with anything. Okay. So use this as an experiment, you know, do what you can do everything. Okay. Great. All right. Any any final questions before we go? All right. Well, um, you know where to find us, and we'll see you on Thursday at the concert. Okay. All right. Bye, Have a day off tomorrow. Take care, Take care everybody. <laughs>